the light bulb went off and said, I got to help solve this problem. I really had to be conscious about what's important. What else can we be doing besides investing in ourselves? The possibilities are in front of you, the past is behind you, but we're filtering everything that we're working with. We have control of our own lives. We can make every decision that we want. The only thing holding us back is us. Well, good day, everyone. This is Dr. David Phelps of the Freedom Founders Mastermind Community and Dentist Freedom Blueprint Podcast. Here today with, um, I'll say a young man, um, certainly younger than I am, but uh, full of life, full of, of excitement, exuberance, uh, Mr. Ben Rayo. Ben, thanks for being here. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, David. Thank you for having me. I can't wait. So you bring, you're going to bring a lot to the table for our audience today. There's so much here, and I'm going to try to try to knife through it so we can get the best of the best here. But let me just say first to our audience, uh, I know you through uh, one of our mutual groups, which is the Collective Genius. It's a it's a group of, of real estate entrepreneurs, very high caliber in the country. I, I will say first, I have not had the honor to get to know you very well. So part of this is selfish for me today, because what I do know about you and have seen of uh, not only being in our group in Collective Genius, but also a few posts here and there. Um, I love your I love your insights. I love who you are. Now, we're, we're going to find out a lot about Ben here today. He is definitely a serial entrepreneur. So he's got that DNA in him. So let's get that set right off the top. Uh, but like myself and like probably many people listening today, Ben had a wake-up call, pretty serious one about 11 years ago. We'll get into that and how that's how that changed his outlook on life and you know what that's meant for him in so many ways. There's just a lot of juice here I want to collect today. So uh, let me just give a little brief background, Ben, and I'm going to get your backstory, Ben. So Ben is an author. He is a serial entrepreneur, business coach, philanthropist, and senior care advocate who lives in Kansas City. He's a partner in multiple national companies within the senior industry that focuses on providing families with better access to resources as they consider aging in place or transitioning to long-term care. Very interesting topic today, and we're going to get into that a little bit towards the end. The essential, he's also the author of Paying for Long-Term Care, The Essential Guide to Understanding and Funding Senior Care. You can find more about this initiative of Ben's at payingforlongtermcare.com. Now, that's where your a lot of your focus is today, not your only focus, but a lot of your big focus. We'll get to that. But I think let's first go back, Ben, serial entrepreneur. Uh, where did that come from? Now, like, did you ever work for a company, you know, in, 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 a, in a W-2 position and then move on? Or just give us your background and how you kind of morph into who you are today and what, what makes you you? I did. I, um, I graduated from University of Kentucky because I grew up in, in Louisville, Kentucky. So I'm a Kentucky Wildcat. Um, I did the five-year plan. My father said, hey, it's time to get out of school. It's time to, uh, time to do that. And I appreciate that he paid for my college and I've been able to play that forward for my kids and get them out college debt-free, which I would encourage anybody to be using 529s or any other kind of mechanism to, to help you get that done. Um, after college, I went to the corporate America route. I, you know, I graduated with a home, home economics degree. Really? Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, home economics. So, 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 I'm just, so I'm just curious with that. I mean, uh, do, do you and your wife like split responsibilities a little differently or how's that work today? Is, is she... I do all the sewing. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I, I, I did. I was an in interior design for, for several years and wow. we changed majors and changed a couple different times and didn't know what I wanted to be. I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up, but um, ended up ended up getting a hospitality management degree and immediately went into corporate America and became a salesperson for a big company. Um, that I sold uh, digital dictation and transcription equipment. So, um, and I, I did really well. And they moved me from Lexington to Cincinnati, from Cincinnati to St. Louis, where I spent a lot of my time and my, my kids were born there. I'd become one of the top reps in the United States out of about 200 healthcare reps selling to hospitals. And I was at one of the incentive trips in Puerto Rico. And I brought my wife to that. And we, we weren't married at the time, we were engaged. and they had a very strict policy that you could only come with a spouse. And we had paid for her own ticket out of pocket and she was going to the events and there's hundreds of people at this event. And I got back and they fired me because of it, because they were concerned it was an HR exposure. And, you know, they didn't want to fire me. I was really successful. And I took about 30 days off and I reached out to my dad who was, who had been in, in corporate America and, and, and he was kind of doing his own thing. What are you doing? And, and he and I started a technology company and I was in St. Louis and he was in Philly. And um, 
we were we were selling technology and services for quite a while. Built that to about thirty employees. Um, from that, I I got into real estate. I always had one or two little rental properties as a passive you know investment on the side from my W two job, and um, and so I really enjoyed it. And I think the interior design. I just like structure houses, and I like you know that kind of thing about houses, and fell in love with beautification and started started buying properties. I actually my partner in that business we met in Jamaica. And that's the reason why I moved to Kansas City. We decided to start doing real estate together and I could do my technology business from anywhere and um, was, had the ability to start doing that. We started buying properties and, you know, I did my first deal and it was, it was a really unique deal and, and we killed it. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is really fun, you know, to, to make that much money off one, one flip. Um, you know, of course, on the next one, I probably didn't make any money because they're not all that perfect, but I continue to do that. And, and we've got about 40 rental properties that we have together that sit on the side and, and we manage from our desks. So we don't really go into them. And that's, we've been doing that for 14 years. And so that's just a tax deduction. And I, and I love just the passive income and, and just kind of building wealth through somebody else paying off those mortgages. And um, that's, that's been great. Um, I learned a lot in that. And I went from there to start a company called Community Buying Group. Yeah. Um, which w- when I was in the healthcare market, there were a lot of buying groups for people buying materials and products, you know, in the dentist industry, you know, you got Patterson and actually my wife used to sell dental software. She oh, used really? to work for Google soft. It was based yeah. out of Effingham. Yeah. Um, for, she worked for them for several years and, you know, I think they ended up getting bought by Patterson and she had left at the time that that happened. But, um, um, so I'm very familiar with that and the buying groups and leverage buying and I decided to do that for real estate investors, mom and pop real estate investors, that they could save money on materials. I convinced Lowe's and Sherwin Williams and some other large companies to give me contracts. And I said, I can drive traffic to buy, pay me a percentage of what I drive. And so th- we did that. And I built that to about $100 million and I sold that in 17. Um, and that's 100 million spending, not revenue for the company. So, um, but but the uh, I sold that in 17 and I bought an old post office. And I said, how hard could it do be to to uh, do a commercial rehab. I've done, you know, 50, 100 plus, you know, rehabs. This will be easy peasy. And I just totally handed me my lunch on that project. I think it was $300,000 over budget on a one and a half million dollar rehab. But it, we got through it. I had to go raise some money last minute. I took, you know, integrity and people knowing me, I was able to do that in a few weeks and um, got that all secured and everything recapitalized and, and, and that's good. And I built a, a incubator called Bridge Space. Um, and so Bridge Space is a, was, a, was a community project for me to be able to create resources for entrepreneurs, startups, small businesses that they didn't have and, and trying to keep those companies in our local community versus going to downtown Kansas City. I live about 10 miles outside of Kansas City and Summit. And so that was just a way to say, how do we give resources, get people, build their businesses. So it's co-working, meaning you don't have an office, about 30 offices, meeting rooms, event space. In 2019, we had about 10,000 people through the building. It was, it was really rolling well. And as you might imagine, there's not a lot of people getting together in 2020 because of COVID. Um, so that hurt the business pretty bad. I've got a full-time community manager that manages that. So I'm a little hands off on that business um, without, without just some strategy direction. And, and through that incubator space, I had somebody come through that was in the senior living industry. Um, it was a small company that was growing and what they did was help people that had long-term care insurance policies, and they would go fight the insurance companies. They would go fight them because the insurance companies don't make it easy for these families to make a claim that they have a long-term care insurance policy. Um, it's been a really ugly marketplace for the last 20 years. It's consolidated from about 200, 200 companies down to about a dozen. So it's made it very hard on the adult children that are typically in their 50s, 60s, maybe even 70s, where they have somebody that's transitioning into long-term care. And, and they hired me to kind of help them be a consultant, grow different areas of businesses that I did well at community buying group that they weren't good at. And that just evolved very quickly into saying, why don't you be a partner? And so I've been doing that for a few years. That evolved into me tapping into my real estate investment background. Um, somebody had called the office um, that had been investing in St. Louis, Philip, who's now my partner at a company called Mom's House. And... Philip had gone out and developed these relationships with local senior living professionals. So placement agents, downsizing agents, care communities, elder law attorneys, anybody that was touching that family at the flashpoint that they were moving into long-term care. And he'd been doing it for about eight years and doing a lot of real estate investment deals out of that. Those are just nice warm referrals that that you're gonna close, you know, 
three, one out of three, you know, one out of two, just because the family is in need, they have a house. It's not been updated because dad passed away. The man always passes away first. And mom's been there for, you know, 10 years doing the best she can to keep it up, but it needs maintenance. It hasn't been up updated. It's grandma clean, but then it's just filled with all the stuff, yeah. all the memorabilia, a lifetime of memories. And that becomes really difficult for the adult children about what are we going to do with all this stuff? What are we going to do with the house? They typically don't live in the same city. I don't know where your parents are, David, but mine are in Louisville and Philadelphia and I'm in Kansas City. So do I want to do, I can't do a rehab project on budget in my own local city, much less try to do it remotely with contractors I don't know and, right. and, and trust and just keep your eyes on it and what's going on. So um, we started Mom's House to teach real estate investors how to plug into the senior living industry in their local market. So we do that through a certification program that people can go through and it helps them to develop warm relationships that can refer families to them to have a real estate um, that, that they need help with the real estate. And so we've done about 100 markets over the last year and a half, um, where we have about 100 markets represented and we have a long waiting list and it's really picked up. We had uh, over 40 people in our last class last month. So it's really starting to pick up quickly. People are starting to understand it and it provides a huge, huge value to the families that are stressed out. You know, those two companies really opened up my eyes to something that happened to me seven years ago when my stepfather got sick at the you know, very quickly. And we try to do home health which means you bring in typically skilled nursing or somebody into your home so they can age in place. It just became too hard, too expensive, too difficult because they needed a lot of care. And we had to move them into, into assisted living or nursing home. And um, I didn't know anything about any of that. I didn't know what his assets were. I had no idea what he had and didn't have. You know, I talk about it in the book. He's the kind of guy that would, uh, you know, I went to get a frozen pizza as a kid out of the freezer. And there was a stack of hundred dollar bills wrapped up in foil in the freezer. Yeah, you know, because he didn't, you know, he didn't really trust the banks. And so it was just, you know, so ha not knowing what he had and didn't have and needing to know all that because of, you know, Medicaid, does the, is the house an asset? Does he get VA in attendance? You know, how to research the right assisted living, dealing with the guilt and emotion myself of like, okay, I'm putting my stepfather, who was one of my role models, you know, my entire life in into a home um, and, and, you know, him not necessarily wanting to do it, but knowing we didn't have a choice. So I, it, the light bulb went off to said, I got to help solve this problem and help families. Um, I've got to help them to understand what's about to happen, where the baby boomer wave is going and what's coming at us, because we're going to have, you know, over 20% of our population is going to be over 65 here in about another 10, 12 years. And so that's going to put a lot of pressure on families. It's going to put a lot of age in place. It's going to put a lot of pressure on our care system. Um, it's going to put a lot of pressure on us as a country because we're going to have 20% of our people over 65, 20% under 18, and, and that middle 60% is going to be responsible for, you know, all of our country's GDP revenue and also taking care of these people. So it's, it's called the silver tsunami, and sometimes it's, it's considered negative, but, you know, it does give the, it gives you that idea of like, we've got this huge wave coming that's going to come and scrape the land and, and all the land is us and all our resources and what's happening and our you know, government being able to pay for you know, Medicaid for people that are basically poor. You need to be poor to be able to basically get that. That's, you know, it's like, that's all coming and we can't avoid it. So how do we, how do we open up everybody's eyes to prepare for it? And that's, that's really what inspired me to write the book, Paying for Long-Term Care. Well, Ben, you, you covered a lot of ground there very, very well. Uh, there's about 15 different rabbit holes. <laughs> uh -oh. into. No, no, it's great. No, it's great. I, I didn't want to stop you because you, because you were, but, but besides where your passion comes from, uh, and I, I'm not putting that aside, that's very, very important. Um, what, what I think our listeners probably also want to know is to me, you are very much, um, well, just knowing that you, you were into interior design and home economics uh, back in the day. And you that's kind of where you started. Then, then you morphed into sales. So what I'm seeing is uh, a very much of a creative visionary in you, Ben, what, I mean, fair to say, right? Yeah. So, so and, and also you, 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 you allowed yourself to develop a lot of different, what I call transferable skill sets, skill sets that allowed you to adapt and morph from, from the the sales career, you know, to the technology business with your dad and, and all these different iterations you've just continued to, to roll into because you're a connector, you're out there, you're a problem solver. So it's, it's kind of like opportunities came through your 
filtered through you through your connections and you and you saw one maybe it was the idea the, the solution that you thought you could provide or and or the person who was bringing it through to you something lit up on you because you're that creative and so aha uh -huh. and you're very good at obviously orchestrating big picture solutions bringing the right people together that's what i see in you where 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 do you find that you need the right person partner or other persons to complement what you do in other words my question back to you is a lot of people listening today are very much in in a technical realm of well, you know, it's, it's a lot of them are dentists, right? Yeah, Who are very right. technically trained to do this one thing. It's very yeah. narrow focus. And outside that realm, it's almost like I would never give up control. Oh, and by the way, you know, as, as dentists, we're trained not to want uh, disruption or volatility or change in our environment. That's very scary. Totally opposite for you. And I'm, and again, I, I'm being very respectful to both sides here because I, I am one. I come from that, that realm. I understand that training. So back to my question, I'll get back to it. Being this visionary, this creative, this person who can see uh, opportunities to solve problems in all these different iterations what do you what what did you need to surround yourself with that you're not good at that's what i'm getting at yeah i think you know that's really interesting and you know i've done i've done the eos stuff with traction and you know i score high on visionary and pretty high on integrator um, but i definitely am a visionary and what i've learned is to hire the right people around me and let them do their job and get out of their way and don't eat even if you can hire somebody that can do it 80% of what you can, that is so much leverage. Uh, one of the things as a visionary I, I really don't like is I don't like training other people. It's like, I have to stop. I don't want to stop. I want to go right. and to stop and create training. But what I did learn, and really most of that came when I was building community buying group, because we built that to about 20 employees, um, is that process procedure is scalable visionary ideas and talk is not yes and so when you when you look at the people that are in the dentistry that have very procedural standard re repeated re repetitive type things i can see where like oh my gosh these other things are just totally scary but if you can get somebody that knows how to do that and do that well and you can give them some control or have them help even get out of your own business to to, to get above it to where you can still grow it. I mean, that's really where it's been. So, you know, I think one of the best hires I ever hired was a full-time executive assistant. Thank you for saying that. I, I keep pressing on my people. That's the first thing you want to do. And it's so hard for, and every, for every, I can't afford it. I can't afford it. It's like, I yes. can't not afford it. She took so much stuff off of my plate that allowed me to be in my zone and what I love and do well and get it off my plate. When I had community buying group, I, I couldn't do it in the beginning and I, and I had to do everything, probably just like a lot of people in dental practice. It's like they have a lot of different things, the books and all these things. It's, um, you know, there's no reason a, a dentist should be doing their books. I, yeah, that's, that's, that's one of those things, it's like get it out of there. It's easy, it's standard. And I think just control, and if you can learn to kind of give up control and you can give up control if you have a system in place and you have checkpoints and accountability and those things. And that's what I've learned. And that's been, the, that's been the greatest freedom for me is being able to say, give it to somebody else. It doesn't always work out perfect, but usually if it doesn't, it's because of me, because I didn't invest the time in either creating a system, training, invest enough in them. It's easy for me to say they screwed it up or they didn't mm -hmm. do well. Um, but most of the time, if I'm really honest with myself, I can turn around and say, I probably should have invested more in the front end and the training, which is the stuff I don't like to do. So that's been probably a big thing just over the last 10 years that I've learned. Yeah, that's that's great insights. I totally agree with you. Totally understand that. Ben, I want to read something that you you posted publicly um, very recently. And I think this is another piece of what I want to draw out today for our listeners. Is it okay if I if I if I read this or read some chunks of it? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Sure. So this, this is what you said. You said uh, in quotes, Ben, you have stage three cancer. Uh, these are words that you thought you would never hear. The melanoma has metastasized from your back to your lymph nodes in your left arm. I thought a skin cancer diagnosis just meant cutting off a mole. It can be as simple as a mole or it can travel through your body. And once it has, it's almost impossible to beat stage four. We need you to be ready for surgery next week. My, my wife was rocked. My mom was totally freaked out. And all I could think about in a surreal haze was, what choice do I have? Let's do this. Let's beat this cancer. So I fought and I won. And six months after the adrenaline and fright wore off, I started to rethink my priorities. 
I'm only here for a short period and I better figure out my purpose and prioritize what's important and what I want my life to look like by design and not just by chance. Was I living my life by design? Was I being the best father, son, husband, boss, person? Who was I helping besides myself? Since then, I've made a conscious effort to live my life on my own terms, not the expectations of others. That's so good, Ben. Not based on whatever self-limited beliefs I may have based on previous experience, and certainly not by the naysayers that might suggest, you can't do that. Since then, I renewed my love for my wife of 25 years. I love you, Rhonda. Put two amazing kids through college debt-free and did everything possible to visit and be part of their life during college. Proactively reach out to friends that, I, that don't live locally just to say hi. Took a life-changing trip with my dad to Italy for 11 days to see our Sicilian heritage. So good. Completed multiple century rides and many sprint triathlons. Employed over 40 people, creating more opportunity and impact for them and their families in my local community. Refused six-figure jobs that would require me to commute 40 minutes a day because I would rather work blocks away from my family and in my community. Traveled to two national parks every year with my son or uncle to see our beautiful country and exercise outside. Traveled four times a year outside of work. Why not? What else is there? Work? Lived with a purpose to be the best person I can be, to have the freedom and quality of life I truly want. Mentored and watched over 100 businesses grow in my local community. Committed to making exercise part of my day and something I have to do. Purposely invest in personal development through masterminds and two books a month or more. Sold a business, closed, closed a business, and started five new businesses. That's you all the way. Published a book, Paying for Long-Term Care to Impact Thousands of Families. Restored two buildings in my local community, and in reality, almost failed at one, going 30% over budget. You mentioned. Refuse mediocrity. Smiled more. I didn't share all this to try to impress you in some way, but to impress upon everyone that we all have the ability to live life by design. If you are not, you're missing out. Life is too short. Take the risk, define, and design what is important to you before you design your work life and get your skin checked by all means look look at all i would have missed if i didn't catch cancer when i did i beg everyone to schedule an appointment with a dermatologist for a skin cancer screen if you spend a lot of time in the sun a minimum of once a year too busy how about dead take just a second and get that appointment get a skin check these days i'm pretty much in the clear they tell me as once you have survived five years without a relapse the likelihood of reoccurrence is less than 10 percent celebrating life and 11 years of being cancer free Ben, you, uh, you, you touched a lot of people because if they didn't know who you were deep down inside, you certainly, certainly that's like a wake up call. That's to all the, I think it's a message to all the driven, hardworking, persevering, wanting to do the right thing people, right? And then we all want to do the right thing, but we get caught up in the doing the thing or building. I told you earlier, like building like whatever that, not the monument to oneself, but just we think we need the security thing, right? We got to build this thing up. It's got to build this fortress up. And, and then in a moment's notice, Life can be snuffed out. So what is this security we think we're building towards? Give me a little bit more of your insight. I love what you wrote. Thanks for letting me read it. I, yeah, and I, you know what? Thank you for reading it. I had not, um, I have not, I had not heard it since I wrote it. Um, and it was, uh, there was a couple of spots that felt my eyes kind of tearing up and like, yeah, wow. I mean, you know, it's, I try to encourage people and, um, and, 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 and there is a book called The Morning Miracle. I don't know if you've ever read that. Yeah, that it, book is amazing. Yeah. Um, if you haven't read that book, I would say go do it. I I have listened to that book ten times. Ten times. I it's just um, you know the whole self limiting belief piece. Even I I had one of those moments today today that I said, you know I shared with you I shared you earlier that what, a year ago I said. I'm going to start working towards being able to do three to four weeks at a time in a remote location. I had the flexibility to work from wherever I want. My kids are in college or about to graduate. And um, I was able to do that. And I'm spending three weeks right now doing that. And I've already booked another three weeks this fall. But this morning I said, why not? It? Why can't I do this every month? I said, why can't I do this every month? And it's, um, it was kind of like, I don't know, because we probably have some self-limiting belief that we have to nine to five somewhere, we have to be in this box just because our parents or grandparents or other friends or other people that don't have the time flexibility or aren't making the time flexibility. I mean, we have control of our own lives. We can make every decision that we want. The only thing holding us back is us, it's us. And I hold myself back, I still do. 
I have to, I have to, I have to kind of check myself and say, wait a minute, what are you making this decision based on what you can go and do forward and grow and do whatever you want and have limitless possibilities? Or are you using that rear view mirror that they talk about in that morning miracle that you're making all those decisions based on all the things that have happened in the past? The possibilities are in front of you, the past is behind you, but we're filtering everything that we're working with or, or considering past on our past experiences. So, you know, I would encourage people to think outside the box to say, why not me? I don't know where I picked up, why not me? I don't know if it was something that I saw or, but why not me is an amazing piece. And I encourage people to say, you know, yell it from the rooftop. I've yelled at my office with nobody around. And it just actually just, I don't know if it's just the act of yelling and breathing hard and, you know, exerting myself, but it actually just drives a whole level of energy back into me. You know, why not me? And kind of questioning it. Why not me? Why, why not me? Right? And you have to say it that way. Um, and I try to encourage people, why not you? You have to think this way. So there's, there's different ways that we as individuals can be inspired. And I think a lot of us potentially grew up particularly going through school, Ben, you know, school is not a place where you collaborate with other people. School, you have to take the test, pass the exams, get the license by yourself. You take, you know, you're, you're in a cubicle. There's no looking on your friend's friend's paper to, to see if you together could come up with a better answer or maybe the right answer or whatever it is, right? That's how school teaches us. And so it's kind of like, we were supposed to be the John Wayne rugged individualist. Take it all on, sure. right? Um, be the strength of the family. What, what's, your, what's your class ranking, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, in, in, in my in my own life, um, you know, I when, when my, my daughter Jenna was going through some horrific times in, in her health situation, uh, first leukemia, uh, which almost took her life, and then she survived that, um, epilepsy, and then a liver transplant at 12. I remember particularly early on with that first, that first, um, crisis which you know again like for you it just comes out of nowhere what what the heck is this why me you know all that stuff this, this it can't be this bad uh and i had the same thinking it's like well i just got to be the stand-up guy in the family right i got to be the rock so i i thought that was the right thing to do i i didn't allow myself to go into the emotions of of, of really the the chilling effect of you know my daughter could could be gone sort of again taking things for granted just going you know we'll get through this kind of thing wrong thing wrong wrong way to, wrong way to go so in in for you um to to get through the challenging times uh certainly there is a part we have to dig inside but what else in your life as far as you talked about you know the morning miracle so books you've read uh what about the people you surround yourself uh, maybe it's part business people but what what else is important for you ben that you surround yourself with uh, your faith family but who else what 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 keeps you going when 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 things aren't going well because i know it, besides your health situation there's been other things you even mentioned you know going over budget and having stuff not work out it, it happens to everybody right give give us some of that how do you get through those those times who else is there to help you um i you know i try to, i try to look at everything in a couple different ways one is i'm always like you know i'm trying to put my family first yeah i am driven and I can't, and I could go and, you know, get really focused and just kind of tune everything out. And um, I, I love to work. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I, you know, to get up in the morning and, and work out and be, you know, and, you know, people are like, you get up at 445, but yeah, I get up 445 because I like to work out in the morning. It makes me feel good. I have some of my most creative ideas then, you know, that's working out for me is a real uh, stress reliever and a real center piece for me. Um, it's just part of what I'm part of my life. It's not like I have to, some days it feels like I have to, but mo most of the time it's just, it's part of just what it's what I do. It's not what I have to do. And I, and a lot of people that do it, love it. And I encourage people to do it, make it part of your life. Um, you know, I've really, I've really had to be conscious about what's important. You have to, you have to ground yourself. And I, I, I do that through a couple different ways. One is actually grounding myself by spending time with my family. So I don't really, I'm, I'm not a, like after I leave the office, I, I don't check my cell phone a lot at night. I don't, I'm not, you know, they kind of say, I don't sleep with it next to my, next to my bed. Um, you know, it's like, how do you just kind of be with the family? Um, I always schedule vacations throughout the whole year in the first 30 days of the year because it forces me to work everything else around that because I know that's what's important to me. 
and, it, and no matter what, there's always a conflict. There's always something I want to go do and we're scheduled to go to Maine for that week. And I'm like, my gosh, can I ever get a break? But it's like, but I'm still going to Maine with my family, right? So it's it's like, that's that's one of those things. And that's that, that travel and that family time, you know, there's something about getting everybody together, being in the airport, even just sitting in the gate and looking around and seeing the family and traveling and being together. And it's just something that's just magical. It realizes like, what else really is there? Um, I, I get a lot of inspiration from people that are a lot smarter than me that write other books and do that. Um, I like to soak that stuff up just because, you know, what, what else can we be doing besides investing in ourselves? I don't think there's any better investment than just what can we just invest in ourselves? Because every time I read something, I get a new perspective, and a new idea and new energy and, and new, uh, new inspiration. Yeah, that's, that's, that's so well said. Well, Ben, I, I appreciate your, your time today and just, you know, sharing your life, how, how you operate, because there's a lot of that for people who, who have that entrepreneurial spirit and maybe, you know, got into a field that's very focused as we talked about. And uh, I, I think there's always inside, you know, everybody, there's that spirit that wants to live, live a, a life truer to themselves, like not based on other people's agendas or industry standards, whatever. And, you know, you, you, you broke that mold <laughs> at a very early age. I mean, you, you, if it was even a mold that you had, you broke it. And I think, you know, well said that, you know, we only have, you know, each day that God gives us to, to live that day. Why are, why are we not living to the, the greatest opportunity based on what, what we feel like is important to us? And, you know, you said it well, I think most people would say, you know, starting, starting with, you know, God, your, you know, your, your family, I mean, just whatever your priorities are, but focus on those and then build your work around that, right? Just your calendar, right? I mean, everything you do, because most of us do it the other way around. And yeah, we, you know, I, I know, you know, Sean McCloskey and um, you know, they used to, he and uh, Steve used to do the, um, life and oh, air. Gosh. Life yeah. And air. yeah, life and air. And it's, you know, it's so interesting when you go through that exercise and I would encourage people that listen to do this, it's like, go through and, and write out the perfect schedule for yourself and then see what's left over that you can work, put your work into. And I know in the dentist industry, it's a lot more structured, but that's also, that's also a self-limiting belief by them. They say that I have to do it this way because this is the way it was always done. Right. Um, and it's, you know, I don't know how many hours a dentist works a week, but I, my, my guess it's a lot more than 40. It's a lot uh, more than 40. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's, it's, we don't always have to do things the way they've always been done. So true. So true. Well, Ben, Ben Rail, thank you so much, uh, today. And again, uh, I think for a lot of us, uh, as you talked about, you know, our, our, our aging parents or other people that we care about, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the silver tsunami. Uh, that's that's another important point. You brought that out again. I want people to, to know that you've authored the book, "Paying for Long-Term Care: The Essential Guide to Understanding and Funding Senior Care." Uh, people can get more about that, learn more about that at PayingForLongTermCare.com. Is the book available there on that website or and it's or available? Amazon? It's there, and it's. Uh, I just so blessed that it, you know it's become an Amazon bestseller in four different categories. So you can find it on Amazon. Um, if you buy it at paying for long-term care, I don't have to give Amazon the extra $3, yeah. Yeah. right? Um, it's, it's a great resource. I just encourage anybody that is 50 years or older, has somebody in their family that's 50 years or older. This is a great read. It's super easy. It's really down to earth. It's not like really technical, but it just gets people thinking about the different things that they should be considering. And somebody said it best and said, uh, blame it on Ben. So to bring up these conversations yeah. with your parents that are uncomfortable yeah. and you don't want to talk about what's going to happen, Blame it on them. No, oh, that's so good. That's so good. Well, you're you're a visionary all the way, and, and thinking through this process will is definitely impacting a lot of people. It has has done it, and will continue to do so. So, Ben, thanks again. I appreciate you being here. Thanks, David. I really appreciate it and helping you get the message out. If you enjoyed watching or learning from this video, please leave a like and subscribe to my channel for more content. If you have a question about any of my content or this specific video, just please leave a comment down below. And as always. Stay focused on your freedom. I'll see you next time.